Hi, and um, I'm excited today to, to, to welcome Cody Steely um, to give a talk on his um, work in Lynn Jordy's lab. Um, he's a recipient of the T32 postdoctoral fellowship in genomic medicine. Uh, he obtained his PhD from Louisiana State University, um, and his graduate work was in comparative genomics under Mark Batzer. And um, he has quite a few notable publications on aloe elements in primates um, to map ancestry, specifically baboons, and so looking at um, primate genomes. And so it's um, exciting to have him here and have all of his expertise and be able to, to work with Lynn Jordy's group um, on this as well. So um, I, I wanted to remind everybody to um, put your microphone on mute. And if you have questions during the talk, feel free to just um, type them into chat and Cody will occasionally, you know, glance over there and see if, if there's any questions to come up with and otherwise we can um, have a Q&A at the end of this. So welcome Cody, I'm happy to have you here and look forward to your talk, thank you. Thank you for the introduction uh, and thanks everyone for being here. So the title of my talk today is Analyzing the Dynamics of Short Tandem Repeats in Large Multi-Generational Pedigrees. And I'm going to start just by briefly talking about what short tandem repeats are and how they can impact the genome. And then I'll move on to some of the genome-wide detection methods for looking at these throughout the genome. Um, next, I'll talk about the Ceph pedigrees and how those have been such a valuable data set and are great for looking at inheritance. And finally, I'll move on to what we found with STR mutation rates and the impact of these. So short tandem repeats, also called microsatellites, I'll generally be referring to these as STRs throughout the talk, are one to six base pair motifs of DNA that are repeated many times back to back. And just so you have an idea of what I'm talking about, here's a toy example of a trinucleotide CTA repeat, and this is repeated four times. So while these aren't huge loci, they do compose about 3% of the human genome, with about 1.6 million of these loci scattered throughout. And they're very highly mutable, uh, with a couple of different proposed mechanisms for how these mutations occur. The primary mechanism is DNA slippage, uh, and this can account for during replication, slippage events occur, and you end up with larger or smaller STR loci. A secondary mechanism is unequal crossing over or recombination events, and these are thought to make up a much smaller proportion of events, and there's not a whole lot in the literature to support this, but it is still a mechanism that's been proposed. So if we look back at that CTA repeat that I showed you on the last slide, Again, it's got four repeats, um, but during slippage and replication, uh, that can change from four CTA repeats and get smaller and become three CTA repeats or larger and become five CTA repeats. Just an interesting aside, Deb had mentioned that uh, a lot of my past work has been in transposable elements and mobile elements, particularly alu elements. Um, and if you look at the genome, alu elements actually make up only about 11% of the genome, but there are 1.1 million of these scattered throughout. And they look something like this, with a left monomer and a right monomer, but separating those are an A-rich region and this poly-A tail. And the poly-A tail is generally somewhere between about 14 and 20 bases long. And essentially with every one of these insertions, there's potential for a new STR. And so when we look at the reference genome and look at all the STRs in the reference genome and kind of overlay these, the STRs and the ALUs, we found that about 40% of all reference STRs are found in ALU elements, and the vast majority of those are actually found in this poly-A tail. So you might ask why we care about short tandem repeats, and these have played a big role in forensics and have been found causative for several human diseases and so I'd like to just touch on that a little bit over the next few slides. So over the past few decades, because of their high mutability and thus high heterogeneity throughout humans, uh, these STR loci have been used in forensics and paternity testing. 
And here in this figure, I'm just showing you the 13 core CODIS loci or STR loci and their relative locations on chromosomes. Um, with these 13 STRs, the likelihood of an individual matching all 13 perfectly is one in several billion. Um, and since the introduction of these original 13, there have been several others added. I think the panel is now up to 16 or 20 in some places. But I also mentioned disease, and I'd like to walk through a few examples of how these repeats can lead to some genetic diseases in humans. And the first that I'll talk about is Friedreich ataxia. And this is caused by a trinucleotide GAA repeat expansion in the FXN gene. And it generally has a relatively early age of onset, somewhere around 20, um, and it leads to common problems that you see with other ataxia uh, disorders like walk, difficulty walking, uh, the gait is very obvious, and then difficulty breathing at certain points as well. The second example I'll talk about is one that many of you are likely familiar with, and that's amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. And this is caused by a hexanucleotide repeat um, in C9 ORF72. And this is the cause for ALS in about 40% of all familial ALS cases. Third is Fragile X, and this is caused by a trinucleotide CGG expansion in the FMR1 gene. And so you, if you look at this figure, you can see that in uh, the normal gene, there's not much of a repeat here, but in the pre-mutation state where you can start to see symptoms, you do have that repeat expansion. And then in the full mutation, that repeat becomes much longer. And because of the CPG sites that are introduced in this expansion, you end up with methylation and eventually silencing of the FMR gene. And finally, uh, Huntington disease, which is caused by a trinucleotide expansion in HTT. But outside of a disease context, uh, STRs are able to impact gene expression with normal variation. So here is a figure that I've taken from Fotzing et al., which comes from Melissa Gimrick's lab. And if you look at the first two genes, CSTB and NOP56, there are repeat expansions within those genes. And looking at the lower portion of this figure, you can see on the x-axis the mean number of repeats, and on the y-axis normalized expression in skeletal muscle. So for the CSTB gene, as the number of repeats increases, this also leads to an increase in gene expression, and that's a pretty clear pattern. If you look at NOP56, you end up with the same general upward trend, but it is a little bit bumpier. And the third example is ALOX5, which is a hexanucleotide repeat, and it's just upstream of the gene near the promoter. And in this example, we still have the mean number of repeats on the x-axis and normalized expression on the y, um, but as this increases, the number of repeats increases, you see a general trend upward, but as it gets too long, it looks as though it might start to trend back downward. And one other portion of a figure I took from this paper shows um, STRs that are shown to influence expression in different regions of the genome. So in gray, we have homopolymers or mononucleotide repeats. And this goes through the purple hexanucleotide repeats. And if you look at most of these regions, you can see a nice distribution of all of these. So if you look at the promoters, uh, we see all of, those new, or all of those motifs represented, as well as the five prime UTRs, three prime UTRs, intronic regions, and intergenic regions, as well as DNA's hypersensitivity regions. Uh, the one real exception that I will point out here are the coding regions shown in well, it's all represented by orange and purple, which are trinucleotide and hexanucleotide repeats. This isn't particularly surprising, as those are in groups of three, uh, and that wouldn't disrupt a reading frame. So now I'll move on to talk about the Ceph pedigrees just a little bit. And these have been an incredibly valuable data set. And the picture that I have here is taken from National Geographic. And you can see both sets of grandparents, the parents, as well as several of the grandchildren included in this. And there were many families that were part of this study, uh, initially sampled in the mid-1980s, and then again sampled as part of the UGRP, or Utah Genetic Reference Project, uh, around the year 2000. But with whole genome sequencing data, uh, these individuals have been part of several studies that I'd like to point out. 
Uh, the first is Tom Sasani's work from Aaron Quinlan's lab, where last year he published in eLife his findings on um, single nucleotide variation mutation rate in uh, these Ceph pedigrees. So the three generations make them really great for this kind of study. And similarly, Julie Fusier from Lynn Jordy's lab last year published a mutation rate study for mobile element insertions using the same kind of strategy. Uh, this has also been used by Molly Korzworski's group, where they looked at maternal bias or how maternal age can impact mutations. Uh, and Richard Cawthon from the Human Genetics Department, who published just this year a very exciting study on um, that germline mutation rate and how that's correlated with longevity. And finally, this year, a very big study in Nature from Ira Hall's group included the Ceph individuals looking at structural variation within the human genome. But based on the success that Tom and Julie had looking at mutation rates in these pedigrees, we also wanted to use the Ceph pedigrees to look at STR mutation rates. And so we have whole genome sequencing data for not all of the individuals that were collected, but 603 individuals in 33 different families. And these are all three generation pedigrees. So you have both grandparents on both sides, uh, the parents, and then all of the grandchildren. And this is an anonymized uh, Ceph pedigree. And in this particular example, there are 13 individuals in the third generation, um, while the mean is nine. So they all might not have 13 grandchildren, but these are still very large families. And once we decided on doing this project in the Ceph pedigrees, uh, we wanted to look at different methods of STR detection to try to pick what was going to be best for our project. And there are a number of tools available for STR expansion detection. Uh, I've highlighted a couple here in Stretch and Expansion Hunter. And these are both great tools, uh, but we're interested in genome-wide expansions and contractions. And so that limited our options a little bit more, but there are still several tools available, uh, many of which have great names that I hope you appreciate. And the first here is Lobster. Uh, this was created by Melissa Gimrick, and it was widely used as part of the Thousand Genomes Project in those low coverage genomes, uh, still having success genotyping STR loci. A second more recent tool is Hipster. Uh, this was published in Nature Methods, and this comes from Melissa Gimrick's lab. And this was a tool that also looks genome-wide, but it has several unique kind of features, especially when it comes to filtering. Uh, it looks at particular PCR stutter artifacts and things like that that help you weed out low confidence genotype calls. Uh, the real limitation with Hipster is that you are limited to looking at STRs that are only read length. So in our case, the Ceph pedigrees, uh, for those individuals that were whole genome sequenced, those are only about 150 base long reads. So we are limited in what we can look at. And finally, another recent tool is Gangster, which was published in 2019 in Nucleic Acids. Um, and this tool, the real benefit of it over Hipster is that it will look at uh, STRs that are much longer than read length. But in our case, we're very interested in the precise length of the STR because we're looking for mutations that change the size even a little bit. Uh, and when you start to filter down using Gangster, looking for only precise STR lengths, that filters out everything longer than read length anyway. So with these differences, we've decided to go with Hipster moving forward. And I wanna walk through some of the benefits and kind of drawbacks to using Hipster. Uh, one benefit is that they have generated a genome-wide uh, reference file using the human reference genome. So this looks at uh, all the STRs in the reference genome using tandem repeat finder to identify those, and then ruling out those that are low confidence that way you're only including those that you're certain about. Another real benefit to using this tool is that you could run multiple genomes together. So in our case, we were able to run an entire Ceph family together at the same time and look at their genotypes kind of in reference to one another. This tool also runs relatively quickly. You can separate things by chromosome and still run the whole family and then get your results much quicker. Um, and finally, something that I touched on before was the de novo stutter estimation at each allele. But there are drawbacks. As I mentioned, we are only looking at STRs that are shorter than sequencing read length, so less than 150 bases. And we can only call STRs that are in that reference file. So we're not finding things that aren't in the reference file, nor are we finding de novo STRs, for example. But there is an interesting tool uh, Harriet Dashnow is making, Sterling, 
and that's from Aaron Quinlan's lab, and I think that'll be a very exciting tool to look for de novo STRs throughout the genome. Before I move on to how we filtered all of this, um, I wanna point out an important distinction that comes up in the filtering. And so Hipster generates results that point out two types of reads. The first are mapping reads, and uh, the reads are shown here in gray, and you can see that a portion of the read maps to unique genomic sequence, and a portion of the read maps to a part of the STR. And these are still used for evidence and support of the genotype, but we don't find these particularly reliable for uh, generating a whole genotype from an STR. On the other hand, the spanning reads that were part of this uh, genotyping analysis were very useful. So the difference here is that the spanning reads, uh, again shown in gray, map to part of the uno unique genomic sequence, and then they span the entirety of the repeat and still have unique blanking sequence on the side. It gives us a lot more confidence in the precise length of this repeat. Now for the filtering itself, um, this obviously starts with running all of the Ceph families through Hipster so that they can be genotyped. And after that genotyping, we used a very well-named tool uh, called Dumpster to filter all of these genotype calls. And just to kind of briefly walk through a lot of the major steps in this process, um, I mentioned the PCR stutter artifacts that Hipster looks for before, and we removed all the loci that had more than 15% of the reads that contained PCR stutter artifacts. If you can imagine PCR stutter through a region, you would get a lot less uh, confidence in your calls, so we ruled those out so we weren't calling false positives. Next, we looked at the loci that had more than 15% of the reads that contained indels or mutations in the flanking regions. And this is because uh, that can influence mapping confidence. And again, we're just trying to weed out all the false positives. And these were two that were recommended in the hipster documentation. This third step is only including genotypes that have a posterior probability of greater than 0.9 as it's assigned by hipster. Uh, those with a posterior probability assigned by hipster of less than 0.9 were removed. So we're only keeping the genotypes that we have the most confidence in. And finally, we removed all of the loci that were in tandem duplications throughout the genome. So um, if you think of an entire region of the genome duplicated and in two locations, mapping to those unambiguously gets very difficult. Uh, so we ruled those out and took those out of the analysis just to avoid any confusion or other false positives. After we'd filtered the genotypes and had uh, good confidence in those, we wanted to look at uh, the de novo STRs in generation two. Um, and so that required further filtering. We identified all of these de novo STRs, and then we only kept those that had at least 10 spanning reads, like I talked about in the last slide, that support the de novo allele. Um, now for the Ceph whole genome sequencing data, these are all sequenced 30X. Um, and so we're only requiring about one third of all the reads mapping to this de novo allele. The second filtering criteria that we also took from the initial hipster publication was requiring that this de novo allele had to be seen in at least two of the grandchildren, partially because they're so highly mutable, but also because these are difficult to sequence through in genotype. And having the support of at least two offspring, having that uh, de novo allele was really important. And to kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. Um, here's an example Ceph pedigree again. I do want to indicate that the zero here does not mean that this individual doesn't have the STR, it's just that they have the reference allele. These are generally coded as multi-allelic states. But if we look at the top right, you can see that both individuals, both grandparents here, are homozygous 1-1. And as you might expect, they pass down to their son 1-1. But if we look at the top left grandparents, the grandfather is 1-1 one, one, and the grandmother is 0-1. And if we look at their daughter, you can see that the grandmother has passed down 0, uh, which isn't surprising. But there's been a mutation that's occurred between the grandfather and the daughter here. And now she has a 2 allele. And then we would look at the next generation. So this 2 is obviously de novo. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that this was seen in the third generation. So here you can see the two of her sons have the two allele.
So after we had generated all of these genotypes, we wanted to find a way to be sure that these genotypes were actually accurate. Um, hey, and so I've been working with Lisa Baird to- Cody? Yes. Um, Mick had a question that came up on the chat, and th this would be a good time to address that question. Sure. Um, I'll get to how many pass. We end up losing about 50% of the total loci, and not all of that is due to our filtering. Um, in some cases, it's just due to hipster being unable to genotype because it's missing reads. So um, if we exclude those that are just missing data and actually filtering, I'd say probably 25% of the total. Sorry about that. The chat's more difficult to see from this side. Um, but we wanted to compare our hipster genotypes to previously genotyped loci. And Lisa Baird has been great to work with on this. And I just wanted to kind of talk for a minute about all the work that went into generating the genotypes on their side. There we go. Um, so they used this automated hybridization and imaging instrument, or AHII, that's described in the JL Cherry publication that I've listed at the bottom. And this technique was adapted for STRs by the Weiss Lab, Mark Leppert, and Lisa Baird. And in total, I just want us all to appreciate how much work this would have been. Uh, there were 360 different STRs that were genotyped in all 43 UGRP families. So even more families than we have sequencing data for, which led to a total of 217,800 total genotypes. Um, and this image on the right is one that Lisa was nice enough to send me, and it's her working on uh, what now almost looks like science fiction technology, but is a very absurd amount of work, I'm sure. So I mentioned all of the loci that they had genotyped, and Lisa helped me get access to these files, which look something like this. Um, I've anonymized the family ID here, so they all say one. Um, and then here you have both alleles for each individual. And this D value at the top is one that if you put this identifier into something like UCSC's genome browser, uh, it will direct you to an STR somewhere in the genome. And if you look at that, you can kind of compare all of these allele values to the reference genome, um, get those values, and then further compare those back to the hipster genotypes that we had generated. And so far, I've looked at about 20 of these loci in a few families, three to five families. And for all of those that passed our filtering criteria, we see that the hipster genotypes match with 100% concordance. So for all of those hipster genotypes that pass our filters, uh, we see a perfect match between what was previously genotyped and what has been computationally genotyped as part of this project. And this gives us a lot more confidence in our uh, filtering criteria and hipsters' ability to genotype these really complex loci. So now I'll move on to kind of what we found, and I wanna start by talking about what's previously been found. Um, so there are a couple of recent studies that have estimated that there are anywhere between about 70 to about 100 de novo STR mutations per generation. Uh, the 70 comes from the original hipster publication where they looked at a single Ceph pedigree to analyze um, how many repeats or how many STR de novos there were in that one pedigree. Uh, the 100 comes from a 2016 publication that looked only at the Y chromosome and obviously has a higher mutation rate. I think I had a question. Let's see. Oh, good to know. That's not the official lobster logo. Um, so those are the estimates from these studies that have occurred recently in 2016 and 2017. Uh, and as far as STR mutation rates, these have ranged from 10 to the negative third, which largely come from Y chromosome studies, to 10 to the negative fifth. Uh, but even those that appear to be about 10 to the negative fifth, they generally focus on a small subset of loci. So focusing on, say, all the dinucleotides or 500 different dinucleotides in a subset of individuals. But here, looking at all of the second generation individuals in the Ceph pedigrees, we find a mean STR mutation rate of 5.15 times 10 to the negative fifth. Um, and this would put it about three to four orders of magnitude higher than the single nucleotide variation rate. 
And this comes from being able to assay about 49% of all STR loci identified in the reference genome. And that's an average value taken across individuals. There's obviously some degree of variation. But with this rate across the 1.6 million STR loci, we would estimate that the mean number of STR mutations per generation is about 83. Um, and that value 83 falls pretty solidly within the 70 to 100 estimate from before. But I'd also like to mention that this is likely a very conservative estimate. Um, we're not looking at those longer than read length for one, and that um, those that are longer than read length have been shown to be a little bit more mutable than those that are shorter. So it's likely that we're missing some degree of the mutations that are actually there. And I think some tools coming forth in the future will be really valuable to expand on this. So here I've got a box and whisker plot of the number of de novo STRs shown on the y-axis, and each individual here is represented as a dot. So each dot is an individual from the second generation of the Seth pedigrees. So the mean was about 41 in the roughly 50% that we could analyze. Um, but if you look, there's a high amount of variability. So thinking back to Tom Sassani's work, he saw a similar pattern reflected in the uh, SNVs. So most individuals kind of cluster around this mean rate, but you also see several individuals that hover around 20 de novo STR mutations, and you know, this individual on the very high end that's close to 100 de novo STRs. So here I wanted to look at just the repeat motif size that's shown on the x-axis, so mononucleotide repeats in green all the way through hexanucleotides in yellow. Uh, and the mean mutation rate on the y-axis. So largely, we see that the mutation rate for each size motif is tied to that repeat motif size. Um, but there are two notable exceptions that I really want to point out. One is the mononucleotide repeats. Um, and here in the reference file, there is something like 800,000 mononucleotide repeats. And either Hipster couldn't genotype them or they were removed during our filtering pro process. So we only ended up on average uh, genotyping about 220,000 of these through uh, all the individuals on average. So this is likely an underrepresentation of the mutability of these mononucleotide repeats. The other notable exception are these trinucleotide repeats. Um, and these are, this is less surprising, these are enriched in coding regions. And as coding regions are more conserved, it's a little bit less surprising to see a lower mutation rate in these trinucleotide repeats. So uh, after identifying all of these de novos and kind of working through that, we wanted to ask how much are these STRs mutating by? Are they growing by a lot or a small amount? And same with the contractions. And we wanted to look at parent trans transmission by phasing. Um, and so I've been working with Scott Watkins in Lynn Jordy's lab, who has been very helpful for this project. And he's created this nice Julia model called STR diff. And this tool uses Beagle to phase the haplotypes for everyone in the pedigree, and then probabilistically determine the parent that transmitted the mutation. So from that, we're also able to look at the grandchildren to make sure that they've inherited the haplotype that contains that allele, um, and that there's no inconsistencies. We're also able to look at the mutation sizes, like I mentioned before, and see the difference between the parent who transmitted the mutation and what it looks like in that next generation as a de novo. So here are some preliminary results that Scott's generated from 191 STRs in three different families. And so STR diff has been quite successful in actually scoring these sites and generating results and it's been able to do so for about 94% of the sites. As for male and female mutation bias, um, we've only looked at three families, but it doesn't seem to be consistently one way. Um, and it would be interesting to see if this is family specific moving forward. But uh, in some families we've seen male bias and some female, but we haven't had a chance to look at age effects from the parents either. Um, so that's something that we definitely like to do moving forward and something that would be kind of unique to this massive Ceph data set where we have all of this background information. Um, and finally, 92% uh, of the STR mutations are a single step or repeat unit change. And what I mean by that is just that uh, a dinucleotide moves by two bases, larger or smaller, um, and trinucleotides would move by 
three, uh, larger or smaller. Um, Aaron asked how STR diff results or uh, differ from phasing predictions made by readback phasing. That is a good question. I think one of the biggest benefits just from uh, Scott's work and what we've talked about so far is just that you're able to vary the haplotype size. So if it's a particularly tricky region, you can continue to look out at wider regions uh, and expand that haplotype until you can hopefully get to something informative. But Scott certainly knows more about STR diff than I do, and there may be other benefits that I'm not as clear on. Uh, one of the last things that I wanted to cover was just the location of all of these de novo STRs. And uh, kind of as expected, in the blue, you have intergenic, uh, those that landed in intergenic regions, around 53% of all de novos were there. Um, approximately 45% were here shown in green in the intronic regions, and then much smaller percentages in the five prime UTRs shown in uh, this kind of gold color. Um, a little over 1% in the three prime UTRs shown here. Um, and then only two of our, all of our de novos were found in exonic regions. And those, as you might expect, were uh, trinucleotide or hexanucleotide repeats. So it's unlikely they've been disrupting a read reading frame. Uh, so Deb asked if there's a trend toward increased size or decreased size of STR changes. And um, Scott has seen a pattern looking at the STR diff results um, where they are expanding. But the issue with that is that we're looking at smaller repeats in general. Um, so I think it's more likely that small repeats do expand. Whereas if we could look at some larger repeats, uh, it seems like the larger repeats generally trend toward contraction and getting smaller. So I think we might have a bit of a bias in that we're just looking at the shorter STRs. Yeah, and to conclude, we estimate the mean STR mutation rate to be about 5.15 times 10 to the negative fifth. Um, again, a couple or three to four orders of magnitude higher than the uh, SNV mutation rate. And with this mutation rate, the mean number of de novo STRs per generation would be about 83. But again, we think this is a pretty conservative estimate between the filtering, um, difficulty sequencing through some of those regions, and not looking at longer repeats because of the short reads. Uh, from Scott's work, we found that most STR mutations are a single step. So again, dinucleotide repeats move by two bases, either larger or smaller, and trinucleotides move by about three bases in either direction, and so on for the others. Um, and most of these, as you would expect, seem to fall in intronic or intergenic regions of the genome. Um, but even those, as we saw from Melissa Gimrick's work, can lead to changes in gene expression. And just moving forward, we obviously plan to keep running STR diff um, on the remaining Ceph families. So looking to see if there is a pattern of parental bias in either direction, something that I think is a real strong point of the Ceph pedigrees. Um, and looking at the parental age effect on mutation rate, I know that Tom saw a pretty strong uh, paternal age effect here. And then uh, we'd like to look for differences in mutation rate based on the repeat length. Um, see if longer repeats, as has been supported in previous studies, uh, are in fact more mutable than shorter repeats. And then finally, perfect versus imperfect repeats. I'd like to find a way to kind of differentiate the two um, and look for perfect repeats, which don't contain extra mutations. So it's just a perfect, say, TA repeat over and over again versus an imperfect repeat, which has mutations in it and kind of disrupts that repeat. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank um, everyone in the Geordie Lab has been very helpful with their feedback, particularly Scott Watkins has been very helpful with this STR diff. And we've had lots of uh, very helpful and fun conversations about STRs. Um, Lisa Baird was really helpful with a lot of the Ceph background and um, information and that data that they had previously genotyped. Um, I'd also like to thank the T32 mentors, Gabor Marth and Josh Schiffman, as well as the T32 administrators, Ashley and Samantha, who have been very helpful as well. Um, and finally, uh, the NHGRI and for their uh, funding support. And with that, I will answer these other questions and I'm happy to take any other questions you might have.
Um, so David asked if any of these families carry a DNA repair mutation. That I am not sure about. I know that's something that uh, Lynn has brought up a few times, and I think several people have had discussions about this, but I haven't personally gone through and looked for DNA repair mutations. But I do think that's a really interesting idea uh, and something that should be very possible with all of the sequencing data. Um, and then Harriet asked about potential allelic dropout. Um, that's something that I guess I haven't explicitly dealt with, um, but it seems as though our filtering has taken out several of uh, the low confidence alleles. Um, I haven't really noticed anything, especially with the de novos, there's obviously some other uh, allele there. They're not homozygous for the de novo. So I haven't seen anything that explicitly uh, looks as though it was because of allelic dropout, but that's definitely an issue that we should look into. Um, and I'm sure I could do that with the hipster output files. Uh, and then are any of the variants we found clinically significant? Um, not that I've seen. I mean, obviously we don't know everything about uh, STRs and how they can impact gene expression, but there were only a couple in uh, coding regions. And I would certainly like to go back and try to overlay these using something like bed tools with known promoter regions and other ways that they might have an impact on gene expression. But Widely, the Ceph pedigrees and cohorts were um, healthy, like they don't have a whole lot of health issues involved in there, and I'm sure I could get some of the phenotypic data and double check that. And I'll just mention that uh, we've compiled a list, Scott has done this, a list of about 200 genes involved in DNA repair. So one of the things we want to do uh, is to assess the effects of uh, any and all of those genes, even maybe a sort of polygenic risk score, uh, to look at their effects on things like STRs as well as other kinds of mutations in the Ceph families. Hey, Lynn, quick question with that list, too. Would you try to look at specific pathways underneath the hood as which ones might be more related to STRs as opposed to taking it as a group? I'm yeah, just wondering kind of how you think so, that would be applied. Yeah, so we might focus, for example, on mismatch repair uh, for the STRs. Yeah, good point, Matt. A couple other questions here. Uh, so short reads, are good to detect those longer than 150 bases, especially with tools like Gangster. Um, but when we were looking for precise read length, so we were really interested in looking at exactly how much this had changed. Um, Hipster's not great for that. But uh, again, I, I mentioned Harriet's tool earlier, um, Sterling, which is really good for finding de novos that are quite large. Um, and then Gangster could most likely, I haven't personally tested it, but most likely identify something like the Fragile X repeat that's quite long. Cody, this is Roma from AREP Laboratory. That's a question for me. We are actually doing lots of trinucleotide repeats, expansion testing, like a Fragile X, myotonic dystrophy, and usually they are quite large expansion. So I'm just wondering, short reads for whole genome will be good enough to detecting this kind of large expansions, or we should moving towards to the longer reads? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good question. And I haven't personally tested it, but I do know that Gangster will pick up some that are quite large. I don't know what the upper bound of that is, and I'm not sure they mention it in their paper, um, but I think the upper bound is quite large. Um, so something like the Fragile X, where it's maybe 200 repeats that might yeah. pick up. Fragile X is a greater than 200 repeats, can be up to 800 close thousand. Myotonic dystrophy, trinucleotide repeat expansion, especially for congenital myotonic dystrophy, the repeats can be more than 1,000 repeats. Ready? can I right. come in on that? <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> Um, so there's, yeah, several tools that can detect these larger expansions, so Expansion Hunter, Stretch, uh, Gangster, 
Um, and they're all pretty good at differentiating between normal and pathogenic long STRs. Um, they only really, they may not be able to accurately determine the size of the very long ones, but they can usually figure out um, the range. Would you be interested to testing? We have lots of positive samples. I would absolutely be interested. Uh, two other questions, just from Deb. Uh, if we see any clustering of STRs that change a lot and don't change at all. Um, I don't have the numbers in the presentation, but there are certainly some, there are many that don't change at all um, in the families. And I think that would be interesting to look at just uh, if those are really conserved or if it's just by chance, maybe in a larger data set. Uh, but we do see some that seem to mutate uh, fairly frequently, not often enough to look like uh, it's really difficult to genotype, but often enough that it's in, you know, two or three families where we see the, see the exact same locus mutating. Um, and then Steve asked about uh, de novos at forensic CODIS sites. Um, I have not looked at that, but I think that would be really interesting. And I would imagine that those are quite mutable loci. Um, so I'm sure it's easy to get that list and it would be easy to kind of overlay our de novos with that list to see if we see a lot of mutations there. But thank you, that's a good idea. Yeah, and I'll just throw in, since I've been involved in some forensic work that, uh, uh, of course, for uh, identification of individuals in, in the forensic setting, the mutation rate is not an issue, but for paternity testing it is. Uh, and that can be incorporated into the calculations uh, involving match probabilities. Yeah, we usually do paternity testing using STR markers. Um, the new mutation rate is one in a thousand. So you will see quite a few de novo, but usually it's not more than two within the 16 markers. So usually you need more than two markers to make uh, at least conclusion or moving the paternity index. Well, if that's everything, thank you all so much for coming. And thanks for all the great questions. This has given me a lot of fun new directions to think about and go. Thank you. Thank you, Cody, for a really wonderful talk. And, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for being online. Um, we had a great community, um, a great questions, and a great presentation. Thanks again, Cody. Thanks, Cody.